uh, to provide some of the specialised areas, but the, minist the ministry training took place, by and large, uh, in the local congregation under the local minister or ministers. So that uh, any man that's being trained for the ministry was never trained, as it were, in a, in a glass house apart or, or, or in a tower, uh, so that he was sort of isolated from the realities of the Christian life and the great issues of God's people and, and the pastoral ministry. Uh, but rather, uh, as it was with Elisha and as, as it was with the disciples of our Lord Jesus, uh, the ministers were trained uh, in the life of the congregation and, uh, and by the ministers that had gone before. And uh, there's much to be said for that, I believe, uh, for the preserving of a ministry that is uh, really in touch with the issues of the church and the needs of God's people and equips for the real issues of the ministry when the man uh, hits the road, as it were, through when he's ordained. So Elisha is, is, is called by this, in this remarkable way through an outward sign and he's brought into the position of learning uh, firsthand uh, with Elijah as he goes about his work. But now, of course, there's an issue to be faced in the second place. Elisha has heard God's call. And, and, the, and the call that he receives is a call that's going to completely... Uh, redirect his life. Uh, this call comes from God and uh, we can ask ourselves, well, well what about Elisha now? What, what's it going to do to him? What's it going to mean for him? Well, Elisha had to hear God's word in the call and that, that was necessary because that, unless, he, unless he was able to interact immediately with God uh, concerning this call, he was never going to have the certainty and, and the confidence that's necessary to pursue the, pursue the calling. So it's necessary for the man who labours on behalf of God's word to know in his own heart and soul that God has called him to the work. He's got to know uh, from his point of view and be able to say, I am assured in my heart, that God himself has called me to this work. Uh, because uh, with the call from God comes an assurance also that God will be with the man in the course of his work and he will also be with the man to use the man as his instrument uh, to do the work of God in the kingdom of God, so that so that without that call, without that sense and, and assurance of call, the man can never be sure that God's with him, and the man can never be sure that God will work through him. Now, now that is so important. And uh, if if we think if we think, for example, of of a, a young man put it with his hand up for the ministry. And he heads off to train. And he's going to come home. And he's going to take up, we, we trust, through a call of the church, work in the ministry. If he's sitting there at his desk saying to himself, I'm really not sure this is where I ought to be. I'm really not sure the Lord's with me here and will work uh, with and through me. Uh, then that, that man is already, in a sense, shaken loose from the work even before he starts. And, uh, and when it gets really difficult and push really does come to pull, as it most certainly will for him in his life on, on many occasions, without that certainty to be able to lay hold of God and go straight to God through faith in Jesus Christ to receive grace and strength to help him in, in those times of need, he's all at sea, he's all alone. And so that call, that, that sense of, 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 of good Certainty and assurance that you've been called to the ministry is absolutely essential for the prophet of the word. He's got to know that God who alone can do the work will indeed work with him and through him. And uh, then, of course, it carries with it, as a second reason why it's absolutely necessary, uh, that sense of call and that reality of being called 
carries with it everything that's necessary for the man to labour in the strength and confidence of the Lord. And to do so through constant discouragements that he's going to face. And Elisha was going to face all the same discouragements Elijah had. And you remember Elijah, just a little while ago, has been languishing uh, under the juniper tree and uh, feeling as though uh, it had all come to nothing and he just wanted to die. Well, Elisha's headed into the same territory. And he too would be required to speak God's word to a people who, by and large, in their vast majority at least, were unbelieving and hostile to God. And they were hostile to his servants. And he's going to be required to labour in absolute trust in God who sent him and in confidence that he was accomplishing his purpose through the word that he continued to bring, no matter what the response was to it. Well, he then would be able to labour in the knowledge that God had called him and he'd be strengthened in the inner man. Uh, he, he would be given the grace uh, and the strength as he, as he continued to commune with God and, and to seek it from his hand uh, because he had been called to the office. I think it would be true to say that there's nothing that will expose uh, our weaknesses as does the ministry of the word in the midst of a largely unbelieving world. Now, his certainty of call and the relation that placed him into God was then going to have to minister uh, the strength he needed into his own soul through which he'd be supported. Now, you might uh, call to mind at this point uh, that Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20, the Lord Jesus addresses it, an occasion where someone who seems a little bit like Elisha said, look, I'd like to go back uh, and, uh, and, and bury my parents. Uh, well, we'll deal with that in a, in a little moment, but that's a quite a different uh, situation. But for now, for now, just remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, as he ascended into heaven, or just before he did, he said to his disciples as he sent them out to preach and to teach throughout the world in the midst of all the difficulties, he said, lo, I am with you even to the end of the world. And, uh, and that was going to be uh, the great encouragement and strength for them. Now, brethren, that, that necessity of a call, uh, I believe, explains why Elijah uh, dealt with Elisha in the way he did. <laughs> to me, it's quite startling to see Elijah uh, saying uh, what he did to Elisha. He throws his mantle on him, and then Elisha says to him in verse 20, uh, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and mother, and I'll follow you. And he said unto him, You go back again, for what have I done to thee? <laughs> Isn't that, isn't that quite, quite something to hear that? How would you like that? Just throws his mantle on him without a word, leaves him to draw his own conclusions with all the symbolism in there, and then says to him, in effect, man, if you want to go back, then go. Uh, I, have, I have no say in what you do. What have I done to you? Uh, I, I, I'm not concerned to influence you. And uh, brethren, I believe that that is exactly the way that Elijah is saying to Elisha, look, man, if you're going to take up this work, you're going to have to deal directly and personally between yourself and God. Leave me out of the picture. And uh, I'm reminded uh, of, of uh, occasions where I've read of of uh, men who'd been called to the ministry, who've gone had gone to their to their pastor and elders and said to them, "Look, I I think I'd, I'm called, feeling a call to the ministry." And uh, it's been recorded that the response they received wasn't all that encouraging. Uh, on occasions, their minister and elders said to them, "Look, if you can go and do something else, you should do it. If there's anything else you can do, do it." Uh, and that was a way of them casting the man 
really into and upon the question, is God really calling you? Uh, don't allow, it's like the ministers and the elders saying, don't allow us to come now between you and God and come to us for our opinion about what you ought to do. Uh, we're stepping out of the way here and we're saying to you, as you stand immediately before God like Elisha did, what is, God's act, what is God really doing in your heart and soul? Is God really calling you? Deal now, transact the business about this directly with God. And, and brethren, I believe that's exactly right, that that should be the case. The very worst thing that could happen would be Elijah steps in and says, Hey, Elisha, I think you're just the man for the job. Look at you. You've got all these qualities and the gifts and the talents. You're just what we need. You, you come on into the work with you. That would never carry him through. He needed to be cast immediately on God, and that's what's happened. And, and, and Elijah, Elisha, uh, being dealt with that way, goes back and uh, one assumes that he said goodbye to his father and mother, although it's not recorded here. But uh, in verse 21 we read, he returned back from him and he took the yoke of, a, a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instrument of the oxen and gave them unto the people and they did eat. And he arose and he went after Elijah and ministered to him. So that's, our, that's going to be our third point this afternoon, that uh, not only does he hear that call, but he responds to it by burning the plough. He burns his plough. He, he returns, and there's like a finality to this. He, take, he takes hold of two of the oxen. By the way, um, it's quite significant that, that there were 12 oxen here, six pairs of oxen uh, that he was ploughing with. He takes two of them and he, he sacrifices them. And the way I read this is that in order to do that, he takes all the yoke off yokes and the, the, the harness equipment off the rest of the oxen. And he, he, he makes himself a bit of a fire out of them all and, uh, and he burns the two oxen on the fire as a sacrifice. But one of the things that sort of might slip past us here is that it's no small thing that a farm at that particular time would, would have so many oxen ploughing. Uh, that, that's quite something. This, this is no tin pot operation that Elisha's family is involved with. Uh, a large uh, team of oxen uh, ploughing what one would assume is a large field and in what you can sort of extrapolate from that is a, is a, is a pretty impressive agricultural operation for the day. And uh, here's Elisha, um, as, uh, as one of the children of that operation, maybe even the heir, is going to take the whole business over uh, and, and he's called to the ministry. So the, the whole of his life is going to be turned completely upside down, going from, from that direction where everything seems sort of mapped out with, with a good stable life, with, with a good prosperous farm, uh, now uh, to take up the work of the prophet with all its burdens. Well, he hears the call of God and he goes back and with a finality to it, he takes the yoke off the oxen, and he burns two of them, and he says goodbye to his former life. Such a calling and such a response is, has actually separated Elisha from his former life. And he's been separated into a calling now in God's service, and uh, it's going to take over not just part of his life, but the whole of it. He's going to be in it with everything he's got and everything he is. He's going to have to be wholehearted. He's going to have to be unreserved. And he's going to have to be committed because he now has a new calling in life. He's God's prophet. Or he's being prepared for it, at least at this point. 
Now it shows us, brethren, something quite significant. It shows us that the call of God to the office of prophet and still to the office of ministry of the gospel lifts a person out of their former calling and their place and their aspirations, their sort of the hopes and their plans, it lifts them out of that and it puts them into a completely different framework and pursuit of life and, and it puts them there as those who are willingly and personally committed to something new and different, and that is the ministry of the Word. And uh, they have to really grapple with that, but so does the church that calls them ever into the ministry have to grapple with that. Uh, God has separated them, as he did here with Elisha, from everything that went before, and they've now got a special calling into the office of the ministry of the Word. They are God's prophet in the world. That's something, isn't it? And, uh, such a calling can really only come from God. Apart from that calling, the word of God to us through Paul, as it is in 1 Corinthians, is let every man abide in the calling wherewith he was called. So the station of life and the, and the job and, and everything else that comes with it that we have in God's providence given to us in our life, we ordinarily are, are called to continue in and labour and serve and glorify God in it. But it's only a special call from God into the office of ministry that can lift a person out of that and redirect their life. That's God's work. Now, I know today in the church world that almost everyone who becomes a Christian thinks that they're going to automatically become the minister of the word. And uh, not only the men, but the women. And, and it's such a common thing. If you went to Africa, every, every man and his wife and most of the animals he's got are the pastor. It's just such a common thing. But that's not true to the word. It's God who makes a minister. It's God who calls a minister. It's God who sets him apart. And when he does, the, the man in totality with all his life and everything he is and everything he has and everything he ever will be in this world is located into the service of God through his word. Uh, I'll say again, that's something God only can do and it's God's work and he does it. He does it. And it's something that is a very, very great blessing to the church in the world that he does it. When the Lord makes a genuine minister of the word, a prophet, uh, God is doing something that is a very great blessing to not only the church but to the, to the world itself. It's a sure sign that the God of mercy and justice is still dealing with the human race when, when he's calling men into the office of the ministry of the word. It's a sure sign that, that God is still at work, even in a visible church like it was in the time of, of Israel and the ministry of Elijah, even in, even in a visible church that is so deeply troubled and, and so riddled with apostasy, it's a sure sign that God is still at work in his mercy and through the gospel with that people that he raises up a prophet to speak to them. He continues to send his prophets to them. And those prophets come. They come on behalf of God. They come on behalf of his covenant. They come on behalf of the gospel. And, uh, and, and, and through those prophets, the ministry of the word in the world and in the church, the way of life is opened up to sinners like us, the way, the way of life and hope and, 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 and the way of deliverance and salvation is opened up for us. God sends his ministry, a prophetic word into our midst. And without it, all is dark and the heavens are shut. But, but when the prophetic word and the gospel is brought into our midst, it's like God has rent the heavens and he's let the light of his gospel loose in the world and lo and behold, it's shined into our life. That's a tremendous blessing. I'm quite sure we don't appreciate what just what a tremendous blessing it is because many of us have never known what it was like 
to live in, in utter darkness without hope and the knowledge of God. But brethren, it is a very, very great blessing when God calls a man like he did Elisha and sends him into the midst of a needy people. We should, we should be aware of that. And uh, when the Lord does that, uh, we should receive it with joy. And we should make very good use of our privileges. We should, we should actively seek God in and through his word. We should be like people who press into the kingdom of grace and people who flee for our very life, because that's what it is, who flee for our very life into the arms of our God through our faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. Elisha was called, and as Elisha's life unfolds, it's evident that he was called because God was with him and God worked through him. Well, brethren, as we close, let me encourage you to pray, pray. Uh, do it today and, and, and keep on doing it, please. Uh, pray that the Lord of the harvest will continue to call men in, in, in this way, perhaps not, but in, in a real way, uh, to send them into the fields that are white to harvest and to send them even into this little church where we live and to send them to our children in their generations because only the Lord can make a minister and only the Lord can work through him. So, so pray that when he calls them out, that he'd also give them all the grace they need he might strengthen and up, uphold them in their labours until the end of their course, and that they might be fearless to preach to us what we need to hear. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this afternoon. It's a, it's a word that is very challenging, especially to men who have been called to the ministry. It's also enlightening and challenging in a wholesome way to us as members in the visible church uh, to be aware that what's happening in our lives uh, and through the ministry of the word is no small thing, not to be taken for granted, never to be presumed on, but to, re to be received with a sense of tremendous gratitude and, and open-hearted dependence upon God through it. Lord, would you lead us through your word to yourself and into all the, the joyful reality and the transforming power of, of your grace. Uh, through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat>